Okay. It is in the process, setting up your meeting for YouTube Live. Done, redirecting to YouTube. Awesome, awesome. Now I am seeing it. It tells me we're live on YouTube now. Okay. Do you, um, well, I, I think I'll go in and see if I can share it. On. Now, do, do I need to leave YouTube on myself? Like I don't think so. And I'm going to go ahead and reclaim host now that it looks like we're live. Yeah. And make you co host so you can keep an eye on who's coming in. Yep. Oh, and Jeff Ober is here. That's oh, nice. Make you co host. Yeah, let's see how it You guys know Jeff over at Geneseo? No. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just went to uh, the Euro, Euro Cafe. Mm -mm. In Geneseo? I have it's not. Right on Main Street. Welcome, welcome. It's a uh, lot of school. It's Hi. Really good. What's up? Cool. Hi. What's up, Ken? What's going on? Okay. Um, what was I going to do? I was going to. Share the Oops. how did you retake being host? Um it uh because I got booted out of the meeting, it allowed me to when I came back in it said it asked me to reclaim host. Oh okay. So normally it doesn't do that, but if you get booted out, you have that opportunity. <laughs> and you can let people in. I think. Pardon me? Let you can go ahead and, and let people in. Okay. Oh, I'm there right now. We will get started in a few minutes. Welcome to Science in the Pub and Science in the Virtual Pub. Oh, yeah. I'm literally like, they're like, oh, you have to connect heaven, hell, and judgment with yeah. my major. Do they actually check that now? Because when I did it, there's no way. Yeah, you have to break it down in every week. That's so stupid. <laughs> I got a 97 and a half on about me. So I guess we've already done the experiment, but if, if you lose internet, Don, uh, evidently the meeting will just continue with me as host. Yeah, I'll, you I'll come back. back on as soon as I realize I've lost you. If that happens, okay. Hopefully, I will. I will give you a shout out. No, you won't hear me. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll call you. If, uh, yeah. It takes too long. Yeah, I'm it's guessing so I, I will notice some pretty short order. So Don, which pub are you in? Uh, Resurgence Brewing Company in Buffalo. Yeah. Sounds like a fun place. Uh-oh, did I lose you? No, I just keep on pressing my mute button. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Shall I go ahead and press record now? Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
we will get started about five after six. So welcome, welcome. You can introduce yourselves in the chat. And we are back in the pub for the first time since uh, October of 2021. Uh, we are at Resurgence Brewing Company in Buffalo. So thank you all for joining us. Here are the coming attractions. Don, as, as host, can you turn off the little bell? Hi. <laughs> Hello, Bryce. Hi. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi Bryce. Uh, I lost. Yeah. I, lo I lost the link, and then I found a back a back way to get into it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you made you hear plenty early because we're actually starting at about six oh five. Okay. It's not too far off now. Six oh three. Pretty close.
got actual people in 3D. I'm so excited. And people online too. So we're going to start about 6.05. So that's just another minute or so. And we'll start with some announcements. So if you need to get a beer, you probably got time to do that. <laughs> So it's about to start the loop again, and when it starts the loop again, I'll tell you what's coming up. Uh, programming through actually May 25th is listed on our website. Um, we are science buffalo science in the pub slash science in the virtual pub uh we started as a project for ken who went away um, <laughs> when he was a student of mine in uh of course i taught at ub uh, a graduate seminar in informal science education and as a project for that class ken started buffalo science in the pub which the first event was january of 2020 then we had one in February of 2020, and then March of 2020 was March of 2020, and we went online, and we've mostly been online uh, ever since, but we've had a few dates back in the pub, and we are very, very glad uh, for Resurgence's hospitality uh, for having us back again. Um, and uh, we are, the program is now uh, second Thursdays at 7.30 with a fully virtual event, and fourth Wednesdays at six o'clock uh, here in the pub. We hope that we can continue with that. What is coming up uh, is we're starting now because it's 6.05 and I am tonight's speaker talking about uh, changes in energy sources make changes in history. And there is Ken who was the, the founder of Buffalo Science in the pub. Coming up on March 10th, uh, we'll have Outwit, Outlast, Out uh, play. Let me uh, back up there. I think I can do that. Maybe not. There we go. Um, Outwit, Outlast, Outplay, a game of bacterial survival in the deep ocean with Brandy Keel Reese, um, who is uh, uh, in, who studies microbial life deep below the sea floor. So there are microbial communities that live uh, more than a kilometer below the floor of the ocean. And she'll be talking about that. Uh, a month from now on March 23rd, we'll be back here in uh, Resurgence with Chris McKay, operations manager for Made of the Mist, talking about the Made of the Mist going electric. They have uh, new fully electric boats. Um, on April 14th, we'll have Dr. Vandana Singh um, talking about, uh, well, Vandana is a very, very interesting physics professor and science fiction author with lots of very good thoughts about uh, how to approach climate change. And she'll be talking about some piece of that. On April 27th, we'll be back at Resurgence with Jay Burney for an Earth Day event. Um, and on May 12th, for Science in the Virtual Pub, we will have uh, Annie Fresh Ozar, um, who is a Muppeteer, talking about the science of making Muppets. Uh, and our final session of the year will be back here on May 25th with a climate change education panel, uh, including several uh, Western New York teachers and some students, uh, uh, both college students and high school students talking about the state of uh, undergraduate, um, or I'm sorry, uh, the state of climate education from their perspectives. And I'll note that um, opening in late March or early April is Six-Legged Science at the Museum of the Earth uh, which is part of the Paleontological Research Institution, and PRI is your host for Science in the Pub. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Usually I am not both the speaker and the MC, but tonight I'm filling both roles. Um, and let me get to the right place here. And so tonight we're going to be talking about when we change how we get energy, we change history. And 
launch that presentation if I can find the presentation button. And uh, can folks both in the pub and online hear me okay? Count on Rob to give me a shout out. Yes, it, uh, you sound good, Dan. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, so we're gonna do a, a quick whirlwind of four and a half billion years of energy history uh, back to the formation of the earth and uh, uh, pay some special attention to interesting bits from upstate New York as we go along the way. And the, the basic theme is that when we change how we get energy, we really do change history. And um, I, I hope that'll come through as we step through. Going back to four and a half billion years ago, uh, the earth formed, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't there personally. Um, and we're gonna do an absurdly brief history of fuel. Um, the earth is four and a half billion years old. Uh, so let me move that out of the way. Um, so there's, there's our timeline. For 90, the first 90% of Earth history, there was essentially no fire. And I don't think this gets talked about nearly enough. There are a bunch of reasons for that. Um, you may remember from your elementary school days, the fire triangle, depending on how old you are. Now they refer to it as the, they, they've updated it to the fire quadrilateral and added a, a, a fourth thing to it. Um, so in order to have fire, you need dry fuel, you need oxygen, you need heat. And the, the fourth thing that they've added is a sustained chemical reaction to do that. Um, if you don't have any one of those four things, you don't have fire. And up until the Devonian period or the Silurian period around 440 million years ago, all life was underwater and life is what makes fuel. It's almost always the product of photosynthesis, either directly or indirectly. So for 90% of Earth history, there was no fire. And we're going to zoom in on to the part where there was fire. There's the first life on land. Um, and there's when we had enough oxygen and um, forests to have stuff to burn. There may have been little spot fires here and there with uh, stuff that had dried out and, uh, and uh, washed up on land enough to be hit by lightning or something like that. There were no sustained fires of any real scale up until somewhere in the or or neighborhood of 460 or 440 million years ago. There's us at the very, very end of that four and a half billion year long line. Um, and agriculture, civilization and all that stuff uh, is at the very, very, very tip of that line with the industrial revolution uh, being even more at the tip of the tip of the tip. Um, and uh, so there's, there's our most absurd look back. Now we'll go back uh, from four and a half billion years. We'll jump ahead to about a million years ago. And about a million years ago is when um, primates before us started to get some control of fire. Um, humans, homo sapiens, are the only species around right now that have any real meaningful control of fire, though um, there are some other animals that have some, some manipulation of fire. And fire is hugely important in the development of us as a species. Uh, it allowed us to digest some of our food outside of our bodies, and that is fundamental to what made us humans. Uh, Neanderthals before us and some other early hominids had some control of fire, um, but if the climate got wetter, the fires went out. Uh, they, um, there were points in primate history where uh, fire could be controlled but was not easy to start. So they had to, um, they had to protect the fire, and if it got wet, they ran into real trouble because they didn't know how to start a fire. Um, and we've been around for about 300,000 years as a spe species. And as I said, some other species have uh, use of fire, but not really control. Uh, Darwin was among the first folks to suggest that language and fire are uh, two of the most significant achievements of humanity. And it, it's really interesting to try and imagine what we'd be like without fire. And we'll talk about that. Uh, some more, and there's some resources if you want to dig deeper, and I'm glad to 
I'll post the link to this in on the, the web page so that you can find it. Um, now we're going to go uh, a ways before the Industrial Revolution, but after we've been doing stuff for a while. And uh, for human history, uh, for most of human history, and like I said, we've been around for about 300,000 years, uh, most of our energy came from us um, and from animals. Um, and it's interesting to think about humans as an energy source. Uh, in much of human history, that meant slaves as an energy source. And that's, uh, uh, it's interesting to ponder uh, energy justice and climate justice throughout the entirety of human history uh, when building those pyramids, um, this, uh, this image uh, said workers, but those, those people weren't there by choice. They weren't moving those rocks around by choice. Um, animals were also, of course, harnessed for, literally harnessed for energy. Uh, Biomass is you know, burning, burning stuff. I think that's some jiffy pop over a fire there. Um, wind has been used for a long time for transportation as well as windmills. Um, and the first windmills are, uh, were more than 2000 years ago. Uh, but Holland is a special case that got really good at it about 500 years ago. And we'll, uh, we'll spend a little bit more time looking at Holland. Um, there were uh, over 10,000 uh, windmills and watermills uh, throughout uh, Europe and the UK uh, a thousand years ago. So uh, harnessing wind and water again is not terribly new. And if we think back to before the Industrial Revolution, all of that stuff uh, was renewable. And then uh, the Industrial Revolution came along. Uh, and I added a mostly there because the reality is that uh, um, the Chinese uh, were the first to harvest, to collect uh, natural gas and pipe it using bamboo uh, pipes about 2,000 years ago. Uh, coal has been burned on some level for thousands of years. Uh, Western New Yorkers have some awareness, maybe, have been to uh, the Eternal Flame Falls down by uh, Chestnut Ridge, where there's natural gas bubbling out of the ground, and people have known about that for a very long time. And we'll actually take a, another peek at that um, in a minute here. Uh, so drawing up closer to the Industrial Revolution, going back to about 1500 or 1600, uh, the Netherlands became a world power, one of the, the first world powers, truly world powers, largely because of energy dominance. Um, and it was both thermal and kinetic, meaning they harnessed both, they figured out how to burn stuff to get heat to do things, and make things, um, and they figured out how to uh, harness the wind uh, specifically, as well as again, uh, water mills were around in ways that nobody had put those two things together before them. And uh, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, the European forests had largely been cleared, so there wasn't as much wood around for fuel as uh, folks might have liked. Um, so uh, one, one of the one piece of the one-two punch was uh, windmills, and we're gonna not watch this uh, mute it, um, this whole nine-minute video, but a, a few snippets of looking at 500-year-old technology that was really incredible and really did some amazing things. Holland became a world power in part because of this uh, being able to. Um, saw huge logs to make bigger boats than anybody had made before. And so that allowed them to build a Navy to, sh to ship stuff all over the world and to fight wars and so forth. And I'm just gonna uh, click ahead a little bit in a few random spots in this video. Um, but uh, it really is amazing industry that they were able to uh, to, to create without using fossil fuels to do it. And at the same time, they did actually harvest some fossil energy. Out there. Been getting me there we go. Um, they uh, began to harvest peat 
in a, in, and again, an unprecedented way. And peat, according to the IPCC, is a renewable fuel source, but that's a pretty shaky claim um, because peat tends to regenerate at something like a millimeter per year or something like that. Um, so if you're burning it by the cubic yard and it's regenerating a million, uh, a millimeter per year, uh, that's not really very renewable. And they had a lot of peat um, and uh, they extracted it and burned it. And there's looking at that. Um, but they're not a world power anymore in the way they were then. And there's a fascinating plot line or plot cycle that plays out again and again and again throughout human history. And they're a good early example of it. Um, first, folks figure out how to get an energy source and exploit it and use it for doing whatever it is they're trying to do. Then they get good at using it, they master it, they use a lot of it, and they use up the stuff that's easy to get. And then it becomes more difficult, more expensive, uh, more environmentally damaging to extract and or use, usually both, I think, in an awful lot of cases, certainly the case uh, for peat and coal and lots of other examples. It's both harder to get and uh, more environmentally damaging. And then it becomes impractical. And that's what we're seeing with fossil fuels writ large now. They have become in, impractical to use. And so the cycle starts over again. Um, you figure out how to exploit a different energy source and use that up. So uh, 1500s, 1600s, Holland was using peat. Um, and they used up the easy, easy to get stuff and it became more and more expensive to get more and more environmentally damaging. And while they were, they were running into those troubles, folks over in the United Kingdom were figuring out how to get coal out of the ground and burn that. And so we're repeating the cycle over again and over again. And we did the same thing also with American forests where um, we uh, uh, 100 or 400 years ago, when people with my complexion first got to North America, we started cutting down those forests for both building materials and for fuel. And a hundred years ago, the Eastern US was essentially entirely denuded of forests. No, no real forests anymore. Um, mostly, mostly for fuel use, but also for building. Now we've repeated that with coal and on and on and on for extracted resources. The wind is still blowing. We're not running out of that. Um, and uh, um, that is both our past and our future, we hope. So that all was before the industrial Hey folks, looks like we have some technical difficulties and we lost Don. Um, so uh, we, I'm sure that he'll be back as soon as he can be. So just hang on for a minute. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and welcome back. And I'm going to go back to screen sharing. So I think we were on the slide when I lost y'all. Try and get you out of the way again. There we go. Um, 
back to full screen. Okay, um, so um, not only uh, did the Industrial Revolution kick off because of figuring out how to get stuff out of the ground and burn it, um, but also because at the same time, people figured out how to convert heat energy into kinetic energy. So the energy from heat to the energy of motion, and that right there is uh, the, the Watt steam engine. Um, and he was not the inventor of the first steam engine, but really the first practical scalable one. Um, and there is the first uh, um, uh, railroad that took people from city to city in, in England. And there is the spinning jenny, which made it easier to make textiles. And there are the image credits if you wanna look further on that. And now we'll uh, um, take a look at some regional history, uh, upstate New York and thereabouts have played important roles in, um, in energy history. And I'm guessing almost no one can read the uh, caption on this cartoon. It is one of my favorite political cartoons. Um, the date is from Vanity Fair. And it actually is the Grand Hall uh, by the whales in honor of the discovery of oil wells in Pennsylvania. So whales were pretty happy about that for obvious reasons because the source of fuel oil to some degree and oil particularly for lighting was whales. And so once we got oil out of the ground, guess what? The whales got a relief from being killed and turned into uh, burned up. So, um, and that was the, the first oil well was just across the Pennsylvania line, uh, the Drake oil well, and we'll see that in a minute um, or two. Uh, really important for Western New York is uh, early electrification was here. This is a picture of the 1901 Pan American Exhibition in Buffalo, where President McKinley was assassinated and Thousands and thousands of people saw a light bulb for the first time in their life. And just imagine if you have never seen a light bulb coming in on a train, maybe, or by horse and carriage and seeing that. That's stunning. That's really a huge, monumental change in human history. And it was here. It was here in Buffalo um, with the power from Niagara Falls, of course. Um, we'll take a quick peek at uh, energy tour. And uh, if you want to look at this later, I can share the link with you. Um, and I think I've got that open already in a separate window. <laughs> this is a good time to note for the Zoom audience, uh, Don, that if you walk too far from the laptop, we can't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, huh. I'm supposed to be on a, on a wireless mic. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you great, 97% uh, of the time, just okay. when you get 10 feet away. Huh. Well, it says, that, it says my cordless mic is on, so. <laughs> okay, no not sure. Huh. Sorry about that. Um, let me actually uh, check my settings there and see. It's got the right microphone. It does not have the right microphone. That is the problem. How's that? Oh, now we hear you really loud. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know how that got uh, shut off. Um, okay, so this is a, a Google map that I put together of um, some sites around uh, central New York, western New York, and uh, western Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just going to kind of click on a couple of them and let you see uh, what's there. Of course, the Niagara Power Vista um, is uh, at the Robert Moses Power Plant, which is the largest hydropower plant east of the Mississippi. Um, in the U.S., it's 2.4 gigawatts, which is gigantic. Um, and it's also the site of one of the first large power plants in the world. So a really important uh, location in energy history. Um, the, there's the Eternal Flame Falls that I mentioned earlier. 
where there's a natural gas seep that's protected behind a waterfalls down in Orchard Park in the Chestnut Ridge uh, County Park in Erie County. There's the Tesla Gigafactory, which who knows exactly how that uh, fits into things. Um, when it was uh, first built, it promised to be the largest uh, photovoltaic panel factory in the Western Hemisphere. I don't think that's actually come to fruition. Um, but it's an interesting concept where they chose to build that here in Buffalo to make green energy with green energy. It's powered by Niagara Falls. There's Elon Musk is weird. The politics of that are weird. The politics of energy are weird all over the place. Um, but there's some, uh, there's some interesting potential there. Um, down in Fredonia, New York is the site of the first gas well which I don't remember if it was 1822 or 1825, uh, the first commercial gas well in North America. As I mentioned earlier, China had actually uh, been uh, extracting natural gas and piping it with bamboo pipes for a couple of thousand years or so. Um, and if we go just across the state line down into Pennsylvania, there's the Drake oil well, um, which in 1859 uh, became the first commercial oil well in North America. And if we go over towards uh, central New York, we've got um, more modern history with Cornell Lake Source cooling, where uh, the Cornell campus is cooled with water from deep in uh, Cayuga Lake. And so all they have to do to cool the campus in the summertime and to cool equipment all year round is pump water. And they're now doing that with renewable electricity from wind and solar. Um, and we'll say more about that in a little bit. And we'll also say more about Kubo. Um, and uh, uh, I'll say a little bit more about um, Kubo, which is the Cornell University Borehole Observatory, which is the beginning of their initiative to heat the entire Ithaca campus with deep geothermal heat. Uh, later this spring, they are to drill a two mile uh, deep uh, hole to figure out if what's down there is what they expect to be down there. And if it is, then they'll drill a second hole and they'll pump cold water down one and get hot water back up from the other. And a few pairs of those holes will heat the entire Ithaca campus, we hope by 2030 and power that with um, uh, renewable electricity uh, from wind and solar. And that will reduce the Ithaca campus's energy use by half because half of the energy use on the Cornell campus goes to heating buildings. And that uh, is remarkable. And that has the potential to change a whole lot of things. Um, and it's not because there's anything special about uh, Ithaca geology. One of the goals of this project is to kind of use the boring geology around upstate New York to show that you can do this anywhere. And it's very, very different from doing it in Iceland or the geysers plant in California where the heat is near the surface. We got to go down a ways. Um, and uh, um, that's, uh, that's a, a hopeful hopeful sign of things to come. And back here and back here. And um, looking at uh, the energy uh, picture for today, um, this is uh, the uh, Estimated US energy consumption consumption in 2020, uh, 93 quads of energy, which is a lot, but it's down quite a bit in the last several years. I believe uh, it peaked at I peaked out at close to 100 um, quads um, maybe five or ten years ago. And now <coughs> it is uh, it's dropped several percent for a lot of reasons. And I look at my computer screen thinking I'm focusing there. There we go. Um, and we'll just take, this is a really complex, really interesting uh, diagram. It's called a Sankey diagram, sometimes uh, called a spaghetti diagram, uh, but it steps through 
and there, like I said, is uh, the U.S. It steps through where our energy comes from. The thickness of the lines are proportional to the amount of, uh, of energy from that particular source. Uh, five years ago, solar was so small, even three years ago, solar was so small that it wasn't really worth showing on these kinds of diagrams. Now it's uh, um, 1.25 um, quads out of that, what was it, 93 quads. So that means more than 1%. That is such huge, mind-blowing growth. Um, wind, you can see, is three quads uh, over 3%. That is, again, such huge growth in not very many years. Um, natural gas is uh, still the largest piece of the pie uh, with 31 quads, about a third of the total. Um, and uh, that has grown in the last few years because coal has shrunk so, so very much. And coal has, has shrunk a lot. The last coal-fired power plant in New York State closed in February of 2020 and had hardly generated any electricity for several years before that. It's been many years that New York State has gotten more electricity from wind than from coal. Most people don't have a clue about that. Um, and it's important. <laughs> um, and you can see, I, I said natural gas is the largest piece of the pie. Actually, petroleum is, is slightly more than natural gas. Um, and a few years ago, the transportation sector uh, passed the uh, uh, electricity uh, sector for um, uh, total emissions and I think total energy uh, use. Um, looking at the where we use it, they break it down into four categories, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. Um, and rejected energy means the stuff that got, went off essentially is waste heat in almost all cases. You can see that's the majority of our energy is going off as waste heat. Um, still, it used to be worse. Uh, when um, when the, the Dutch were burning peat to uh, make iron, they were uh, using, um, they were using peat, which is pretty inefficient in its, itself as compared to coal and other energy sources. Uh, and they were using inefficient processes. Now, um, the amount of energy required to produce a kilogram of coal is uh, something on the order of hundreds of times less than it was uh, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and, and before. Um, there's way more to explore. Let's see how I'm doing on time here. Um, uh, this, uh, the first graph is from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, stuff on the Energy Information Administration website as well. I wanna say again, uh, loudly and clearly that New York has been coal free for a while now. And, um, and that is changing pretty quickly. We'll come back, I think, to the EIA site um, in, in a minute, because we've got enough time. Um, so uh, first off, if you think you know about the energy system, but you haven't been keeping up on it for the last three years, your knowledge on it is way out of date. The energy system is changing with remarkable speed. Um, we are moving away from coal uh, to a huge degree, all kinds of uh, new um, renewable projects coming online, mostly wind and solar. Um, solar is now coming on faster than wind after wind was faster than solar for a long time. Um, as I said, we've gotten more energy from wind than from coal in New York for a while. Texas has been the largest producer of wind energy um, in the country for a long time. Last, in the last 12 months, 10% of vehicles sold around the world were electric. That again is a stunning, uh, <laughs> I just, I just, my, my Fitbit is telling me that I, that I made my, my day or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, but 10% uh, uh, of the global vehicle sales last year were electric when three years ago, it was much less than 1%. That is, again, an incredibly rapid change. And it's also, I think, really important to emphasize 
that uh, electric cars are way more efficient in a whole lot of ways. They have environmental problems as well. But thinking, uh, we need to think about how to make our individual vehicles more efficient. And if you're interested and you're still here when I'm ready to leave, you can come out and see my electric car. It's, uh, oh, I've got an electric Kia Nero over in the parking lot there, which I love. But we need to think about how to make a transportation system more efficient than cars, in addition to thinking about along the way how to make more efficient cars. The miles per ga gallon equivalent of my electric Nero is I believe 137 miles per gallon EPA comparative rating. That's pretty good, um, but it pales in comparison to a train. Um, and I think uh, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll figure out how to get there. And in a huge number of places, it is less expensive to build renewable infrastructure than to build fossil fuel or nuclear infrastructure. And that's been true for a few years now. And the advantage keeps getting better and better and better as we go forward. Um, and again, back to uh, highlighting some initiatives in upstate New York. Uh, Ithaca's got some cool stuff going on. Um, PRI, the Paleontological Research Institution, it's Museum of the Earth, and Cayuga Nature Center is my employer. And I've been telecommuting from Amherst since 2008. Um, so I'm, I'm of both places. I actually only get to Ithaca in the before times I was getting there about once a month. I have not been there that frequently uh, since the pandemic started. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff uh, going on that I'm just going to give the a pretty quick uh, look at. Uh, Decarbonize Ithaca is the initiative that um, Ithaca announced in the fall and November, I think, that uh, they are pledging to uh, completely electrify the 6,000 buildings in the city of Ithaca. All, all buildings, residential, commercial, industrial, um, will not use fossil fuel infrastructure anymore. Uh, by 2025, Ithaca will get all of its electricity from renewable sources. We're actually pretty far along the way in much of upstate now, partly because uh, thanks to Robert Moses Power Plant, which is, like I said, the largest um, hydropower plant east of the Mississippi and the largest power plant in New York State. Um, so uh, those uh, that initiative to decarbonize Ithaca um, will be green electricity by 2025 and fully electric, full electrification of all of the buildings in the city of Ithaca by 2030. Um, you can tell uh, that's kind of a big deal because it made the Washington Post and the, un and the Onion. Very proud of that. Um, and uh, my colleague Rob and I are part of the outreach team for the Cornell University Borehole Observatory, which I was talking about a little bit earlier and oops um and i'll um point us to the website for kubo and i won't uh, i won't show the video um here much as i'd like to uh i will uh, we've got a pair of videos up um the project um the outreach component of the project is fairly new um but we've got some materials coming online including these videos and i will note that that's my daughter um so <laughs> so you should go watch them um but you should watch them where you can hear them better than you'll be able to hear them in here uh the second one just went up uh less than two weeks ago um and we'll be adding more, more and more uh content to those outreach materials and developing some teaching materials as well over the uh, uh the coming couple of years and months. So uh, watch for that. And I think that might be about the end of the presentation. Let's see if I can. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's the end of the presentation. So I'll take uh, questions, comments, smart remarks from, yes. No. 
Yes, we can do that. Um, so the question for the folks online, the question was uh, for the Kubo project, for the deep geothermal project at Cornell, can we do that in other places? And the fundamental to the project is the idea that there's nothing special about Ithaca's geology. If you go down deep enough anywhere on planet Earth, it's hot enough to, uh, to, to do what needs to be done. And at a depth of two miles in Ithaca, we expect to be close to 100 degrees Celsius, close to the boiling point of water, um, but we don't actually need to reach the boiling point. Um, so I think it's, I think our, our best estimate is that it's about 90 degrees Celsius, um, somewhere in the ballpark of 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we expect that to be the case in most places. And, it, uh, and there's actually a map in, in some of our materials uh, showing the best places around New York State for doing this. It's a little bit better south of Buffalo, but it just means you need to go a little bit deeper here than there. Um, other questions? Yes. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> of the, I'm sorry, what? I, uh, for, the, for those at home, I have caught my, uh, my wires <laughs> in things and hopefully didn't lose you all. Um, so the, the status of which project? Uh, the, the steel winds in Lackawanna? Yeah. yeah um, I know. Oh, the new ones? No, I, I don't really know. I know they're coming. Um, I know they're, uh, they're bigger turbines than the steel winds, than the original ones, but I don't really know uh, details. Um, Don, there's a yes. question in the chat. Oh, well. and Rob, Rob is saying something. Hello. What? <laughs> hey, Don. There's a question in the chat. Uh, okay. I can, you want me to read it to you? Yeah, go ahead. How fast is the construction rate for hydroelectric plants and does it differ depending on the type? Yes. Okay. That's a good question. And I'll, I'll get to you next. Um, so the question there was uh, asking about the, the rate of development of hydroelectric plants and, uh, and what was the second part, Rob? And does it differ depending on the type? And does it differ depending on the type? Um, well, um, Hydroelectric plants are not being built in the US right now on any kind of scale. In fact, more are coming offline than going online for a variety of reasons, environmental concerns primarily of restoring rivers to their natural, uh, more natural state. Um, but there are other uh, places in the world where they're being built, including, um, I know there's I don't know the status of the project up in Northern Quebec or Ontario, um, but there is a, there is a large uh, hydro plant coming online that's been in the works for a long time, that some of that, some of the electricity from that will be pumped down to New York City, according to the desires of the builders. Um, but hydro plants, large scale hydro plants, are becoming less common to build. And uh, I do actually have um, in here, stowed away, I was looking for a, a newer version of this graph, which is why I didn't um, include it, is because this only goes up to 2012. Um, but it shows in 2012, the capacity of all the power plants in the US by, uh, energy source, and it shows it in two different ways. Um, the pie graph is just a, a straight pie graph. The line graph uh, is showing the the proportional area era, areas rather are the same um, underneath. So the yellow compared to the green here versus here um, is the same in both graphs. Um, but the line graph adds an interesting other component of um, when the uh, power plant was built. And if you look at this up to 2012, you don't see much hydro after that last big one in the mid 90s. Um, 
And that's for all of those environmental reasons. And it also doesn't mean that if we go back in time to the 30s and 40s, that all of the power plants being built in the 30s and 40s were hydro plants, but the ones that are still in operation are. <laughs> so a lot of, a lot of stuff has, has gone by the wayside. And this is a really fascinating graph. And I wish the EIA would update it and, and give us uh, what's been going on because we'd see a whole lot more wind and solar would actually show up. You can see that back in 2012, solar was too small to graph. Um, it isn't anymore. And wind is actually uh, a much larger piece and coal is a much smaller piece than it was in 2012. Um, so um, there are also on the hydro question, there, are all, there is also micro hydro, small scale hydro. So if you've got a, a stream on your property, you can potentially um, capture uh, electricity from that, which I think is actually really pretty cool if you do it in a way that, that doesn't ruin your backyard ecosystem. And you had a question. That's a great question. And it was essentially asking, um, comparing the rate of decarbonization to the rate of el new electrification um, and uh, whether those are in balance or what. And uh, we, are, we, are making, uh, we are making new low carbon infrastructure as fast or faster than we're shutting down the carbon intensive infrastructure. And that's a lot of that has to do with coal plants going offline. Um, you get rid of a coal plant and, um, and you uh, r replace it with anything else <laughs> and it's lower carbon. Um, but especially if you're building wind and, uh, wind and solar um, and you know, maybe geothermal, but geothermal for electric generation is you need the right place like the geysers uh, plants out in California. Other questions? Other we have questions a question online. In the chat from Amy, what is <clears throat> with the increase in renewables? How much decentralization and more small-scale overall electricity production do you think we are headed for? That's <laughs> my asking about my crystal ball is maybe a little dangerous. Um, but uh, the question for the folks in the room is with the increase in renewables, how much decentralization and more small scale overall electricity production do you think we are headed for? And that's a, my, I don't trust my crystal ball too much to make any strong predictions. Um, and it's really a, a complicated question in part because um, having a whole bunch of small systems is hard to make efficiency improvements in. Uh, so I think a, a nice example of that uh, is the streetcar system, the cable car system in San Francisco, where um, they run these cables around. There are no power sources in the cable cars. They are, uh, there are cables running underneath the streets that drag the cable cars around. And that means that when you replace the, um, the motors that are running those cables, with a more efficient motor, you've upgraded the efficiency of the entire fleet in one fell swoop. Um, with distributed generation, you can't do that. Um, but I think rooftop solar, particularly in remote locations, um, that's a very, very good logical way to go. And, and small scale wind is a very, very good way to go if you're disconnected from the grid. And we also need to improve the grid by a lot. We need to make the grid. Uh oh, looks like we lost Don one more time. Hopefully he'll be back soon. <clears throat> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Lost you again. Hi, just telling you that we lost you again. Okay. Okay. And we'll be back on in a moment. Sorry about that. And uh, having lost you means that I lost uh, whatever was in the chat, too. So uh, are there more questions in the chat, Rob? Actually, there are. There have not been. OK, but we got another question in the room. Yes. Mm -hmm. It depends on where you live. So the question was, they've got an EV. Is it more efficient um, because electricity tends to come from coal? And as I noted, not in New York State anymore. So if, but yes, we still get natural gas and natural gas is, um, is still a large part of our energy production, our electricity production. Um, but the majority of electricity in upstate New York is from low carbon sources. It's hydro and nuclear. Uh, yeah, the geography of, of energy is absolutely fascinating. Um, where where you live defines where you get your energy from, what source you get your energy from. So in the Midwest, there's still a lot of coal. In uh, the Northwest, um, there's a lot of hydro. Um, and uh, uh, in, the, in the Midwest, it is switching from coal to wind fairly rapidly. Um, so it's, uh, it's very, very interesting to see how it looks different in different places. And there's, I've got another presentation on that, but it's out of date. Yes, Mike. Yes, yeah. Uh, so again, the, the question was, um, is the uh, electricity industry responding to the need um, for increase of power for electric cars. And um, the overall electricity demand is not changing all that much, in part because buildings are so much more efficient than they were uh, 30 years ago. Refrigerators are a number of times more efficient than they were 30 years ago. Um, lighting is more than 10 times more efficient than it was. So while the need for electricity for transportation is increasing, the need in virtually every other area is decreasing. So um, there's not been a, a huge, uh, that, that's not been a problem thus far. And I don't, I don't expect that it will be. Other questions, either online or in the room, yes. All of the above. <laughs> um, so the question was, as, uh, as de demand uh, shifts and, uh, um, you know, in periods of high demand, how is that demand going to be met? Is it uh, batteries? Is it um, uh, pumped hydro? Uh, so, so using reservoirs as a way to sort of use your water as a battery by pumping it uphill. Um, uh, and, and it's all of those. And, um, and I can't believe I haven't said it yet. The, <laughs> the only truly environmentally friendly energy source is the one you don't use. 
and we're getting better at that. We're getting better at using less and less energy to do the things we want to do. Uh, so, you know, right now I'm, I'm standing here in Buffalo, but I'm also standing in a dozen other places online. And that, uh, that energy savings from uh, doing things virtually is really very large with huge potential to continue, uh, as well as dealing with issues of access for uh, people being able to, to get to conferences and professional meetings and things like that. If you're nursing a kid, it's really hard <laughs> to go across the country to a conference for a week and figure out how to manage all that stuff. But if you're just getting on Zoom, <laughs> uh, it's not so bad. And uh, um, yeah, I, there, there are obvious downsides to not being in person for certain things, but the, the upsides are huge as well. So it's complicated. And it's complicated for the, the question about uh, balancing load. Um, and part of it too has to do with the smart grid and uh, balancing loads by uh, asking uh, customers to uh, do their laundry at night and, and things like that. All, all of those things add up. Other questions? Hey, Don, Don uh, yes. right hand here. Uh, I don't. Hi, Bryce. I'm too new at this stuff to know. I don't. I don't know the etiquette. I don't know if I'm cutting somebody else off or something like. No, that. you're good. You're good. Well, anyway, um, I'm curious. You know, I'm all for geothermal. I'm, you know, uh, but um, uh, obviously, when you pump water down, cold water down one well, and pump hot water up the other well, and then use the energy, um, you the, you're you're cooling some body of rock. Obviously, right. you've you've considered this, and but yep. I'm just. I'm just curious about uh, how what the decay curve, if you will, uh, is of that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, for example, how far apart are the two wells, and what volume of rock are we talking about? And you know, th questions like that. They're, I'm curious about it. Yeah. So Bryce is asking um, if you're pumping cold water down one well and hot water back up another well, um, aren't you cooling off that rock down there? And isn't that eventually going to kind of use up the heat? And the reality is that the mass of rock that we're talking about is so, so huge that uh, we don't anticipate that being an issue. Um, if, uh, if, you know, and, and part of it is it too is solved by, if it starts to cool off, drill another hundred feet down <laughs> and uh, you've got this, this next mass of rock and the, the likelihood of, using up that heat in a way that changes the dynamics of the system seems pretty unlikely. But then again, we didn't anticipate that burning fossil fuels would change the dynamics of the atmosphere. So we always have to be alert to those kinds of issues and, uh, and sort of anticipate that we'll go through that cycle of uh, finding an easy to use energy source and um, using up the easy to access stuff and do envir more environmental damage and so forth as we go along. But best, our best guess is that that's not too much of a concern for a long time with deep geothermal. Ken. Well, it, um, it's, uh, it's not because the, the, the lake is, is so large and I don't even know if the, the water, so Ken asked, um, pumping the water from, are, are you talking about lake source cooling? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was, so uh, Ken was asking about how lake source cooling affects the temperature of the lake. And again, it's such a massive lake. Um, Cayuga Lake is, is how deep, Rob? 600 feet, something like that. Um, so, so it's such a massive lake that the amount of water to cool Cornell's campus uh, is, is tiny in comparison to the thermal mass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping in the fall to have <laughs> a, a science of Bitcoin mining for a, a science in the virtual pub speaker. I'm not as I'm not 
as well versed on that as I, I hope to be soon. But uh, so the follow up question was about uh, Bitcoin mining and there's a uh, central New York power plant that reopened to mine Bitcoin. Um, and there's, I, I am deeply concerned about <laughs> uh, Bitcoin. I think it's an inappropriate uh, way to do anything. Um, but I, but I am also pretty ignorant, so I shouldn't swear too loudly about it, but, uh, strikes me as a, a nightmare six ways from Sunday. So I'll try and uh, I am, I have reached out to a couple of people for, uh, uh, speakers in the fall on, on that issue. Exactly. So hopefully we'll have that up and running, uh, sometime in the fall. Other questions? Yes. One more. Mm -hmm. No, no, not yet. So the question was, is the exponential growth of EVs putting a strain on uh, the electrical grid? And the answer is at least not yet. Um, and again, we have excess capacity. That 10% that I mentioned earlier was global EV sales. Um, I think in the US it's around two or 3%, um, something like that. So much less than the, the global growth of EVs. So um, because of the overall decrease in energy demand from other sources, uh, the increase from EVs is not really a, a, a concern right now. Maybe. Maybe if it grows, continues to grow at the rate that it's grown in the last couple of years, that might become a problem, but I, I really don't think so. I and mean, we've got more uh, electric generation capacity than is used right now by a fair amount. Um, and that's partly because there are a lot of only lightly used uh, coal plants right now. And uh, um, most natural gas plants aren't anywhere near their uh, full uh, capacity, and that's actually true of most power plants. You don't run th want them running at full capacity anyway. Um, one last question from anyone, either online or in the bar. I have a comment, if I can offer a second sure. one. Tom. Yep. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to think that uh, solar energy, apart from the fact that it also powers all our whole agricultural system, right, um, uh, is underrated. That is, the numbers don't show what we really use. Yeah. Uh, every day when the sun is shining on the east side of our house, we open all the windows. There's nothing better as a solar collector than a window. And uh, we open that and then we pull the blinds or whatever on the other side. And then that all changes and reverses in the afternoon. And uh, yep. this is using solar energy. But of course, that that doesn't we don't we don't credit that in the statistics. yes yeah so bryce's comment for the folks in the room was that we don't give we don't count all of the solar energy that that we actually use including how when the sun is shining you don't need your heat as much and uh um and if you've got a clothesline you know that's free <laughs> once you put the clothesline up um and there's actually a, a fairly long list. And of course, all of agriculture, the growing of plants is, uh, is powered by uh, solar energy. And there's another question in the chat. What are your thoughts on the proposed New York State ban on gas powered devices such as lawnmowers, weed whackers, et cetera? And I am very much in favor of those bans. I think those, uh, uh, those little gas engines are really horrible for the environment in a huge number of ways. So. Um, and they're irritating in my neighborhood. The electric, <laughs> the electric ones are much quieter. I have a, an electric mower and uh, an electric snowblower, battery powered uh, for both of those. And the technology there has improved so rapidly in the last few years for, um, for small uh, uh, power tools like that, that it's, it's really, uh, really remarkable. And um, you can do a lot and, you know, I'm, I'm living with buff. I, I bought my uh, electric snowblower in one of the storms in early January here because I was afraid I was going to have a heart attack if I if I shoveled it as I used to do because I'm fat and old now. Um, and it cost me, uh, I think, about $400 for a battery powered uh, snowblower. 
and it does the trick in a Buffalo winter with a kind of long driveway. I, I do have to take a break and charge in between rounds two, if, uh, rounds one and two, if there's a lot of snow, but it works. And same with my uh, uh, electric lawnmower. And I'm hoping to shrink my yard yeah, so that I don't need it again. You know, kind of like thinking about how to make something more efficient than cars, um, make something more efficient so you don't have to mow your lawn at all. <laughs> is really the ultimate answer for some of that stuff. Any other uh, questions folks are dying for? I'm, I'm glad to stick around here and- um, On you can replace lawn, you can replace grass with Pachysandra. It doesn't need watering, it doesn't need mowing. Yes, yeah. It takes so, care of itself year round. Yep, that's on, on the long-term to-do list is to replace my yard. Yep, ah, thank you, thank you. And thank you all. It's so nice to be back in 3D and to have it, I think, work reasonably well for the folks on Zoom, too. Right? It seemed okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, other than the fact that we yeah. lost a couple of times. Right. We, we heard you loud and clear, and we could see the slides. So great, great. it was a good dual presentation. All righty, and, and thanks so much. And uh, join us on March 10th for learning about microbes deep below the seafloor. And... Uh, we will we will see you all. I think I'm going to click uh, to end the Zoom meeting. And uh, this has been recorded. So if uh, you want to share it with anybody else, it's on PRI's YouTube channel already. Bye-bye. <laughs>